Hello and welcome to today's webinar, um, Pipe Soil Structure, the Progressive Loss of Soil Caused by Relentless Infiltration. Um, my name is Jessica Williams and I'm the Marketing Manager at Avanti and I will be playing the host or moderator for this event. But before we get started into um, all the content, I wanted to remind you about a few things. Um, we're going to hopefully have some time at the end for some Q&A. Um, in your GoToWebinar panel, there is a question box. So at any time over the next hour that you think of a question you want to send to the presenters, please go ahead and, and insert it. And hopefully we have time to get to some of those at the end. Um, so now I want to let each of our speakers um, introduce themselves. So um, Chris, if you don't mind. Sure. I'm Chris Macy. I work for Ecom. I'm the America's Technical Practice Lead for Condition Assessment Rehabilitation. Um, just a big kid at this stuff. I've uh, been at this for about 43 years and uh, uh, don't saw any signs of growing up yet. So hopefully you have some good information to share with you today. Great. Thank you. Mark? Hi, I'm Mark Webb. Um, I'm the Senior Technical Leader for Pipeline Design and Condition Assessment, also with AECOM. All right, and then Britt, last but not least. Good afternoon. My name is Britt Babcock. I'm the president with Avanti International and I've been with Avanti in my 11th year now and um, in construction and rehabilitation for over 25 years. Part of that was uh, 12 years as a geotechnical engineer and I'm excited about today's presentation. I think everyone's going to really enjoy uh, what Chris and Mark have to say. Um, we always look at uh, rehabilitation and how we fix, how we fix infiltration. But we've never really looked at how pipes fell and, and um, how important that bedding is in soil. And Mark and Chris are going to share that with us today. So I'm really excited about today. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, so one more thing before we get into all the content. Um, there's going to be a couple of poll questions intermittently through the next hour. Um, we just like to um, keep you engaged and, you know, make sure you're paying attention. So I'm going to launch the first one now. So. The question, what percent of your total treatment volume is from infiltration? Your choices, 0 to 10%, 10 to 25%, 25 to 50%, or 50% and plus. Give you about 20 seconds to get votes in. Right. A few more seconds. All right. So poll results you can see on the screen. 50% uh, of you said 10 to 25%, 27% um, 0 to 10. So um, it's about what we thought. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to give the presentation over to all right welcome welcome we're going to talk first about consequences of infiltration and inflow really more focused on infiltration because that's what our presentation is really about right the relentless impact infiltration has on pipe stability and how it pipes in um, filtrates in those fines in the soil surrounding the pipe and the pipe bedding and backfill so what is infiltration and inflow well uh, wanted to find that infiltration is actually the groundwater that enters the sewer collection system through de different defects it could be cracks in the pipe it could be joints that have uh, lost seal um, joints that have been deflected pipe sections that have been deflected so that's what infiltration is defined as is really that groundwater that comes in through those different defects whether it's in pipelines or manholes um, whereas inflow is really surface water that's what enters the sewer collection system um, flooded vents uh, leaking manhole lids, um, storm drains, basement drains that might be tied into the system, basically anything uh, that may come from the surface. So those are the definitions between infiltration and inflow. Um, I am, there we go. So why does I and I matter? Well, according to the EPA, um, nationwide, almost half of all the flow at treatment plants and our wastewater treatment plants um, is a huge problem and it only 
uh, ionize almost half of that flow, and it's a huge problem because it only worsens over time if it's not removed. So um, think about every dollar that we spend uh, building more wastewater treatment plants, those dollars can be spent um, if we can control the flows, reduce the flows. Uh, if we can spend building schools and parks and things like that. So controlling infiltration is a, is a pretty significant benefit. So let's take a look at a system. This is a just a quick snapshot, a little bit busy. Shows where infiltration and inflow may enter into the system, but we're going to focus on infiltration today. Um, And so what can happen, we'll have a storm pipe, generally always at a higher elevation than the sanitary sewer pipe, and sometimes those pipes may intersect each other. And when that happens, you oftentimes can have connectivity between the backfill, because oftentimes, because storm pipe doesn't have any kind of sealant, exfiltration can happen, fill in the trench bed, and then that trench bed can then fill in the trench bed of the sanitary sewer pipe, and just compounding the potential water that can flow into um, the pipe. <clears throat> Looking at a cross section of that now a little more closely, um, we can see all the different aspects of the system. And this shows one configuration where a pipe might be, storm pipe might be offset of the center against the sanitary sewer pipe. It shows how it's slightly higher. Storm pipes typically are left and right, possibly two, to service either side of the crown of the road. Um, and a sanitary sewer pipe might be in the middle. But what happens when um, the system starts to see these are the different points again um, and we're focused on the sanitary sewer pipe and as this water starts to uh, groundwater starts to rise starts to infiltrate into the system we could potentially start to see degradation in that system here's a system that shows cross-section shows a tap and a T um, uh, for service lines coming in Again, multiple points of location where inflow can happen from a pipe bedding, from failed joints, uh, cracking. And as that happens, we'll start to see degradation of the system. And, and Chris and Mark are definitely going to talk a lot more detail about that. We'll see offsets of the piping. Um, we'll see the joints start to fail, causing more and more infiltration. And so um, kind of that same cross-sectional snapshot now where we see some of that degradations that's happened. We've seen some of that structural integrity loss, the pipe movement, the joint separations, and soils filtrating into the pipes at those open gaps and defects. And it can only worsen with time. And if not uh, remedied, captured, prevented, uh, can really wreak havoc on a system. So our asset collection systems and our infrastructure are a very key investment for any municipality, any district. We definitely want to take care of it. And when left unchecked, it can really get severe. This is obviously a pretty severe situation, but a lot of this funneling and this cause happened because of water infiltration and loss of soil stability. With that, I'll pass it off to Mr. Chris. There we go. Good pipes gone bad. We're going to talk about rigid pipes primarily today, and not to not to intimate at all that that rigid pipes versus flexible pipes are are better or worse. But they're just we we have a a lot of of old rigid pipes in the ground, and a lot of rehabilitation we do and assessment we do involves them. And and a lot of what we're going to talk about is equally relevant to to flexible pipes. It's just that. The, the unique thing about rigid pipes is that is the, the way they act over time uh, changes. And, uh, and I think one of the things that, that is, you know, a, um, an epiphany for me over time is this, you know, when we talk about aging infrastructure, we think about things getting old. And uh, a lot of the, the discussion we have or the, the, the interpretation is that is the pipes are just getting old, the materials are getting weaker. And sometimes they do. Sometimes we have things like H2S attack or degradation, but even in areas where we have degradation from, from internal or external face, it's actually the holes in the ground that will develop and, and, and the transference of soil structure through there. So sometimes this happens, but when we, you know, a lot of the failures we look at, particularly in materials like clay tile, that clay tile is a, a material that 
has incredible longevity. From the Babylonians, to, you know, about 1600 BC to present day, we've got clay tile that's in immaculate shape. We also have some clay tile that looks like, the, you know, the, the the picture on the right there. So when we look at pipe failures, you know, some of them you can blame on 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 material degradation. Some of them you can blame on the pipe, but really, from a practical perspective. Uh, a, a lot of them are failures of soil structure. And, and Mark is gonna give you a good overview of some insight into, you know, from the, from the pipe side out, from both rigid pipes and some flexible pipes of, of the differences in, in the interaction between the pipe and the soil, and, and what that teaches us about things breaking down. And from a practical perspective, the, the, the soil can be your best friend and it can be your worst enemy. Uh, but you're going to be in control of that. You can often choose what you know what that is, and and in terms of what role it plays in in, in pipes moving. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to to Mark, and he's going to give you a good overview of of pipe soil interaction from the you know from the pipe perspective and from the beddings perspective. Great, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Britt, for the introduction. Let's see if I can advance the slide. There we go. So. I'm going to try and talk at a very high level about uh, soil pipe interaction, uh, you know, as a basis for the rest of the, the presentation for today. So I'm going to start with just a definition of what is soil pipe interaction. And then I'm going to talk about pipe behavior and pipe stiffness with a focus on pipe rigidity and load. And um, I will then talk about soil behavior and stiffness, but I promise I will only talk about basic uh, characteristics as far as soils are concerned. I will not bore you with a lot of the details, but I'm trying to show the variability that you know we're dealing with when we're designing and installing pipelines. And that's that's not just from, from the pipe stiffness, but also from the soils. Um, and then another layer on top of, of pipe and soil uh, variability is you know coming from design sophistication. So you know when we're designing smaller pipe or larger diameter pipe, there's also another layer of, of variability, unfortunately, that we introduce as a function of pipe size. So I just want to highlight that. So basically, give you a bit of background and say, well, there's a lot of variability that we have to deal with, and, and that means a lot of variability in the in the installations as well, and the quality of the installations and the problems that we typically see. Um, having said that, I will then say, well, what do we do now? How do we analyze this? And one way to do this is to use uh, what's called the finite element analysis procedure, or FEA in short, um, which is a great tool and very you know, powerful way to, to analyze soil pipe interaction. Um, I'm then going to shift gears a little bit and talk briefly about uh, you know, pipeline construction with a focus on pipe bedding and, and launching. And I'll explain exactly what that is. But the reason I'm doing that is I want to show the importance of doing proper, you know, bidding, bidding support and pipe hunching. Um, and that, that kind of leads into the discussion of loss of soil support. So I'm seeing, uh, you know, poor hunching underneath the pipe as, you know, a similar situation that may occur when you have infiltration and loss of, of bedding or hunch support under a pipe. And I'm going to use the finite element method to show you just some, some results for a case study that I was involved with on a steel pipeline, where we looked at the, the uh, impact of, of doing proper um, onch support under the pipe. And I'll show you some results for stresses and moments and things like that. I, I will not go too technical, but I think it will give you a good visual indication of what to expect you know, when a pipe loses support in the bedding. Uh, I'll close with a just a slide, one slide on the on flexible and rigid pipe response to loading, just to illustrate how these pipes support, you know, a small overburden load, um, and and that will be the final slide then from my side. So let's talk about soil structure interaction or soil pipe interaction. It can be defined as the combined study of geotechnology and structural engineering with a focus on the interaction between the two fields of study. Understanding the mechanics of behavior allows us to predict the performance of the structure or the buried pipe and the influence on the pipe's performance resulting from the surrounding soil. And also the influence on the soil's performance resulting from the buried pipe that we put in the ground. So it's really the interaction between 
all these different disciplines, say in the pipe, the soil, and then of course the interaction between the two fields. And now you introduce all the different stiffnesses and rigidity and insulation conditions, and you know you are dealing with a lot of variability, unfortunately. So let's talk about just pipe behavior and stiffness, um, focusing on, on rigidity and load. This is a chart that's, I know it's fairly old, but I find it really useful to explain, uh, you know, pipe rigidity and, and loading. So on the horizontal axis, I know it's busy, but if you if you can follow on the screen, you can see my cursor perhaps. On the, the horizontal axis, we are plotting the flexural stiffness ratio. Now that's, it sounds complicated, but it's really straightforward. It's really just the, the, the soil stiffness divided by the pipe bending stiffness. And I'll show that in the next slide also. So it's just a ratio of soil to pipe stiffness. Um, so all the way to the left on the horizontal axis would be rigid pipes. Uh, you know, these are the pipes with a fairly high stiffness. So the ratio of soil stiffness to pipe stiffness is quite low. And that's also indicated in the bottom of the chart, we can see, you know, the, the uh, classifications, you know, going from rigid to semi-flexible to flexible system behavior. On the vertical axis, we're looking at the percentage of the load uh, that's supported or carried by the pipe. Now, all the way to the top left is clay and concrete pipe. And that's really the focus for today's discussion. There we go. So they plot all the way uh, on the top and on the left. Um, so what this means is um, rigid pipe like clay and concrete basically support or carry just about all the load, all the soil load above them. They get very little support from the surrounding soil or the side for material you know, to support the, the overburden load. So they're basically telling the, the soil in the, in the trench, you know, uh, we're strong, uh, we can take a lot of load, you know, bring it on. So they carry a lot more load compared to flexible pipes. So as you go from the top left to the right, the bending stiffness reduces, the, pipe, the pipes become more flexible, they deform, uh, they shed some of the load onto the side form material, and the whole mechanism changes from a rigid uh, mechanism to a more flexible system where the, the pipe becomes more dependent on the structural backfill material to support the overburden load. Out of interest, the uh, numbers next to the squares are indicative of the diameter pipe, diameter to wall thickness ratios. So typically for the clay and concrete pipe, you would have fairly low D over T ratios. That means that you have fairly high wall thicknesses. So the D over T ratios are, are quite low. You can see they vary from, from nine to about 12 for clay pipe and eight to 18 for concrete pipe. And typically as you go again from top to bottom, the D over T ratios would increase. If you look at a steel pipe there, um, that's about halfway down, you'll see the D over T ratios typically vary from about 100 to about 250. Um, so that's just a good indication of, of the D over T ratios um, and then the you know, the expected rigidity of, of pipe as a function of the load that they support. When we go to the next slide and we talk about stiffness, this is just to explain the different types of stiffnesses. Again, it's a busy slide, but it's, it's fairly straightforward. On the left-hand side, we're looking at pipe bending stiffness. And this is really nothing else than, than taking a pipe and loading it in what's called a parallel plate loading apparatus and we're measuring the deformation of the pipe under the applied load. Um, the formula or the equation for calculating the pipe bending stiffness is shown in the bottom left. And that is equal to EI, which is Young's modulus times moment of inertia divided by 0 0.149 times the radius cubed. Um, another way to express the bending stiffness is just taking EI divided by the diameter cubed. Uh, that's a very good informative indication of the rigidity of the pipe or the lack thereof. So the lower the stiffness, obviously, the more the pipe will deform and the more dependent the pipe will be on the backfill material for support and supporting the, the overburden load. On the right hand side, we're looking at what's called the pipe hoop uh, or radial stiffness. And this again is, is simply, you know, it can be explained simply by saying that that is the rad radial deformation of the pipe uh, when it's subjected to a uniform radial pressure. 
Um, so in the equation, uh, all that you have to do is, is to calculate the Young's modulus times the moment of times the cross-sectional area, sorry, of the pipe divided by the radius. In the middle of the of the chart, there's a table, um, and all I'm trying to, to point out there for you, it's it's basically a two meter diameter pipe, steel pipeline with a 12 millimeter wall thickness. So if you do the calculations and keeping the previous slide in mind, it will give you a D over T ratio diameter over wall thickness of 160 and a calculated uh, pipe bending stiffness um, of 223 using the parallel plate uh, calculation formula or about 4.1 kilonewton meter per meter. Now that may sound uh, you know, like just glibberage, you know, just you know, unuseful information, but if you do a few, few calculations and you start comparing these numbers, you'll, you'll soon appreciate the importance and the meaning of, of these values. Uh, one example, if you just go down to the to the next line there and you look at, a, at the same pipe diameter, two meter diameter, and we're increasing the wall thickness from 12 millimeters, let's say to 20 millimeters, the D over T ratio, ratio will reduce from 160 to 97. And we can see that the pipe bending stiffness shoots up to about a thousand kilonewton meter per meter or close on 19 uh, kilonewton meter per meter, depending on which formula we use. So that's telling us the pipe is a lot more rigid, uh, it's less flexible, it will deform less, it's less dependent on the site for material for support as well. So it's really a very useful and easy way to calculate pipe stiffness and tell us you know, what and how the pipe will behave uh, once, once installed. The whoop stiffness on the right hand side of the, of the table is just a, a big number because we're using the Young's modulus, we're multiplying by the cross-sectional area and dividing just by the radius. So in both cases, it's it's still a very high number. If we want to, we can we can introduce another layer of, of complexity and that is simply taking these stiffnesses, both bending and hoop stiffness, and we divide by the soil stiffness. And then we, we come up with what's called the relative stiffness. And again, that is, you know, that's really a good indication of, of the, the stiffness um, as a function of pipe to, to soil stiffness. So that's enough about pipe uh, pipe stiffness. So let's talk about soils. And again, this is literally just one or two slides on, on soils. And as you know, there's a lot of variability out there and there's a lot of factors we have to consider. So these are some of the characteristics that we typically concerned with when we design and install pipelines. We would be looking at uh, things like pipe stiffness, uh, sorry, the soil stiffness or the soil strength. Uh, compactability, permeability, fines, migration potential, frost susceptibility, moisture content, and unit weight. And just to illustrate uh, some of the differences uh, out there, uh, the chart on the right is basically a, an example of three different soil types. We're looking at a salty clay, a sandy salt, and a gravelly sand. And horizontal axis, we're plotting the percent uh, compactive effort as a function of standard proctor density. And on the vertical axis, we're looking at the, the percent uh, compaction density. All I'm trying to illustrate here is if you look at, at the vertical axis and you look at 0% effort, so if you just dump material, no compaction, you can see that there's a big variability in the compaction density that's typically achieved. So a clay would get you to about 45%, uh, whereas you know sand gravel material, you can get up to about 60% density without applying any compactive effort. And as expected, as we start you know, running the compactors or the rammers over the material, you can see that a, a gravel sand material will quickly pick up and reach 90% standard proctor density. And that's that's done or achieved at a at a compactive effort of about 17%. Um, and and the same the same goes for for the salt and the clay, except that you obviously need to apply a lot more effort. Um, so that's just a you know brief explanation uh, of the variability in in, uh, in compaction density. And the next slide will repeat the the you know this chart as well, but I want to introduce another another vari variable here. When we talk about compactability, we can define it as you know, the compaction effort required to achieve a desired soil unit weight and stiffness. Now the chart on the right, the top one we've already discussed, and you can, you, I think you can see 
the large variability or variation that you can achieve as a function of soil type and compactive effort. But what's just as important, if not more important, is the figure on the bottom right. And that is the same horizontal axis compactive effort, but we're looking on the vertical axis at relative stiffness. And as expected, uh, you can see there's a large variation in the, uh, the um, stiffness achieved as a function of soil type and compactive effort. So a clay material, a salt material will have a much lower stiffness compared to a sand material for the same compactive effort. And that's very important when we select and specify materials for backfilling pipe. So a final layer of, of um, very variation is obviously when it comes to pipe size. So when we talk about design sophistication, typically when we design small diameter pipes and we install them, you know, they're installed with uh, little inspection and quality control. Uh, they require simpler design methods based on conservative assumptions to account for uncertainty. Um, and we can do that because the consequences of failure are obviously less. We also use, you know, um, more or simplified methods. Um, we can use Marshall Spangler load theory to design these smaller pipes. As the pipe sizes get larger, um, you know, they have to be installed with medium to good inspection quality and quality control. Uh, they require more accurate and complex design methods based on, on you know, the cost of materials. Um, the consequences of failure are obviously much larger compared to a small pipe, and they should be designed using approved design standards and, and you know, things like finite element analysis, analysis as an example. So understanding all the possible variability out there, one way to, to solve the soil pipe problem or the system problem is to look at finite element analysis. And to try and summarize this in a couple of slides, what, we, what we're doing is building a finite element mesh of the real insulation. In this case, the photo is actually a full-scale buried pipe test that was conducted on a 10-foot diameter thin-walled steel pipeline with the aim of collapsing or failing the pipe. It was loaded to a deep soil cover and then you know, a lot of instrumentation, instrumentation was installed um, and the, you know, the pipe was modeled. So the, the finite element mesh is uh, developed to represent the actual installed condition as closely as possible. As you can imagine, it's very powerful and it's ideal to analyze you know, a lot of different things in terms of insulation conditions, bedding configurations, uh, different soil placements, layer thicknesses, pipe sizes, pipe types, pipe stiffnesses. Um, it's well suited you know, to model incremental construction and nonlinear material behavior. And you can see on the right, uh, we can predict um, the incremental response of a pipe and the backfill materials as a, function, as a function of the depth of cover. And we can predict soil stresses, soil strains, and the structural responses of the pipe, like moments, thrust, and, and uh, normal pressure distribution. The model is also great for studying and understanding uh, things like uh, you know, loss of soil support due to infiltration, as, as an example. And that's what I'll show next in the, in the last few slides. Um, we can use finite element analysis to, to study and look at um, you know, the, the impact of a future trench excavation, corrosion of an invert you know, in a, a metallic pipe, as an example, or culvert, and also void formation or you know, issues resulting from infiltration. Um, and then, of course, creating a loss in the, in the support to the pipe. And that's what I'll show in the, in the case study that I mentioned earlier on. Just to, to talk about pipeline construction, two very important aspects of, of, of installing pipe is, first of all, the pipe bedding. This is the zone that, you know, that, that, um, that fills the space between the top of the foundation and the bottom of the pipe. And the bedding is placed, graded, and compacted to provide a uniform support along the length of the pipeline to offer proper grade to the pipe when laid on the bedding and to provide firm support and to maintain grade over time. So that's obviously the, you know, the importance of the bedding, which is, you know, it's critical for the, for the support of the pipe. And we like to use free draining sand and gravel materials for the bedding for that purpose, because we know that they will not change too much over time, as long as you don't have you know, a lot of issues with uh, infiltration. 
The next very important or even more important aspect, let me just back up, sorry. Is, oh, sorry about that. We wanna talk about pipe punching. Um, that is extremely important. Uh, if, if, if there's one thing you have to do right is, you know, to do proper hunching. And this is where we work the material into the, into the lower uh, triangular areas below the pipe to provide firm uniform support and with the idea of remaining stable over time. Like I say, if there's one thing you want to do right is you make sure you install and, and do proper hunching uh, underneath the pipe. I was fortunate enough to be part of a study at UMass where we looked at 14 different pipe tests on different pipe types, different pipe materials, and different hunching techniques. So we studied, you know, the impact of doing rod tamping versus shovel slicing versus, you know, any other methods of working the material into the pipe hunches. And following the test, you know, we could actually pull the pipe out and inspect the hunches to see what sort of support we got. Um, now. Using the finite element method and, and trying to, to bring this all together for you and to see where this is going in terms of infiltration and loss of, loss of support, uh, this is a case study that I was that I was involved with where we looked at the impact of, of poor hunching, so no hunch support or working material below the pipe versus you know pipe with proper um, hunching. Uh, the top chart is an indication of the horizontal stresses that you would expect to see. And this is again for a steel pipeline. But you can see in, in this case, the top figure shows what happens if you don't have proper hunching. You can see that there's an increase in lateral stress next to the pipe. So the pipe has to deform more uh, into the sideful material to mobilize support from the, from the, from the sideful soil because of the lack of support you know, below the pipe. Compared to the case with proper hunching, we can see you know lower stresses developing in the in the soils next to the pipe. If we look at the bending moment distribution, uh, the top uh, figure is the the case without the hunching. And if you if you can see that, I hope the, the screen is clear enough. But you can see that uh, with without hunching, you would expect to see higher moments uh, in the in the hunch area as well as in the invert region. And it's at least 30 to 35% higher compared to the case where you've you know, done proper hunching below, below the pipe. So the pipe is definitely working harder to bridge over the, the poor or the, you know, the unsupported uh, hunch zone. If we look at the uh, normal pressure distribution, the top figure is again uh, without any hunching and you can see a non-uniform uh, uh, support uh, in the hunch zone uh, next to the pipe. Um, and if, if you really focus your eyes, you may be able to see increased um, um, areas right next to the hunch zone in the bottom, uh, next to the invert. So definitely uh, not a great situation. If you look at the bottom chart, that's more what you want to see is a more uniform uh, radial support or normal pressure distribution around the pipe, indicating good support to the, to the pipe. And then finally, we can also look at the, you know, the impact of, of hunching on the, the bedding material and the top left chart of figure, sorry, uh, just shows you that in this case, when you don't have proper hunching, you may end up in this specific case uh, with multiple elements in the bedding layer approaching sheer failure of the soils in that zone compared to the case on the right with proper hunching where we have just localized elements in the bedding layer approaching sheer failure. And again, you know, that's, that's you know, indicative of, of infiltration and loss of support as well. So to summarize uh, this session, um, flexible, flexible and rigid pipe response to loading. On the left-hand side, we're just looking at a flexible pipe and the way that the flexible pipe supports overburden load is by deforming and mobilizing support from the side from material. And you can, you can see a more uniform radial pressure distribution typically developing around a flexible pipe. Whereas on the right hand side, when we start talking about rigid pipe, we know these pipes are much stronger and they support the overburden load through moment and shear. So you would expect to see you know, higher pressures at the crown region and the invert region. As the loading increases or as the bedding uh, deteriorates, or if you have loss of bedding support or hunch support, the pipe will start to crack. Um, and you know, you'll see the cracks at the invert and the crown region on the inside and then on the spring line regions on the outside. 
these cracks may lead to, to fractures and eventual collapse, depending on, on the, the, the condition. So that concludes my section. Right, I think there's another more. poll. Yep. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll launch the second poll question now, and it should be on your screen. The question, do you believe infiltration is a significant contributing factor to structural failure of pipes? And yes, no, not sure. about 10 more seconds. All right, we've gotten most, most votes in at this point. So I'm gonna close and share the results with you. 84% say yes, 7% no, and 9% not sure. All right. All right. Chris, you have control. Okay. Hang on there. When rigid pipes break, I think one of the things you want to remember is that last figure of of, of what happens, and it's a uh, it's uh, something that we've known uh, from uh, you know for a long time. But it's it's uh, what happens to that rigid pipe relative to how it how it reacts after it breaks. And, and it's a it's a problem or a, an observation that goes right back to the first work ever done with rigid pipes when Aston Marson, you know, at the at the Ames uh, soil cell facility or uh, basically started to look at breaking rigid pipes, concrete and clay tile pipes in 1910 to 1920 era. And and one of the, the phenomenal things he saw that were quizzical when you download his work and you can still download it is it's fascinating is that he found he could break pipes but he couldn't collapse them and it, they literally in all of their original soil tests for about the first 10 years never had capacity to collapse a pipe but they they certainly could break them and they were they learned a lot about soil loads in them the the other thing that they concluded and they certainly knew is that the behavior of the pipe after it broke wasn't the same pipe and and in essence if you you know look at what's happening and and that pipe breaking outwards and and mobilizing some soil support is you go from active to passive soil pressures and and in essence just mobilizing a little bit of soil support you just have to move soil a little bit even bad soil and and you have a much different stress distribution around the pipe so soils played a key role in this and and they knew that and they 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 understood it they understood it in terms of design the other thing and i think if, if you read the original work it was more irritating is they also observed that is that if they moved water in and out of the pipe basically that basically moved the soil. And that was very irritating. And, and in the context of one of the first things they invented to better understand the pipe is, is the, you know, the notion of using concrete bedding or what we would use now of a controlled low strength material is, is putting that type of material around the pipe is really good because water flowing in and out of the pipe didn't wash it away. And it's one that has existed obviously for a long time and, and, and something that we use you know, in, in, in our current work. The, uh, Key thing that if you kind of fast forward into understanding collapse pipes is in the UK uh, from the Water Research uh, Council eventually leading into the work that that we'll talk about in a, in a in a bit that is the sewer rehabilitation manual is they started to study why this you know this phenomena of of pipes breaking and what it took to collapse a rigid pipe and that difference in in performance and plus like four point uh, cracking was uh, was studied by by Troth and and in uh, a team in uh, in a soil cell facility and then in some real installations uh, in the early 80s late 70s early 80s and they they again the same process they learned the same thing that that Marston understood is that they could break pipes but when they that just that little bit of mobilization of of soil around it in essence the 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 load it took to collapse a pipe was was usually about a factor of six it was huge. What happens, and, and from a practical perspective, we have you know consensus that, that that type of structure is actually stable. It's still stable to this day, and we look at it, and up to about 10% loss of cross-section, we consider it to be stable as long as we see those little hinges acting. We see it acting like a pipe mobilizing the soil support. What's going to break it down over time is not the materials getting any weaker, and, and the materials can be 
the same type of concrete strength that they were when they were built or the same type of clay tile material properties that were built with, what's going to break it down is the loss of soil. Is that basically water flowing in and out of the pipe and, and in a, and a rather uh, uh, an ironic you know, twist of fate is that the, you know, the very material that is very good to support the pipe, the granular materials that we put around the pipe, the sand that requires so little compactive vector is the material that on the converse, if you have water flowing in and out, is the easiest to move. The materials that are the worst materials that we would use for bedding, the clay material, materials that we would have to put a lot of effort in to make them structurally strong, are materials that in essence are hard to wash away. But this concern of failure, if we look at these pipes, is, is really related to the stability of the structure and something that we can learn from experience. And, and when we go from this type of work and, and transfer it into what we look about for rehabilitation. And I know as rehabilitation, a lot of us think that we're building structure, but in essence, the key feature of every type of rehabilitation technology from, from grouting technologies to lining technologies is how, how effective is it at arresting progressive loss of ground. It's one of the most effective or most important things you can understand. And when we look at this you know, close fit technology on the liner side, there's huge structural benefits. Just by you know, stopping that process, and dealing with the, the you know the load case that is presented that that uh, that Mark presented in terms of the pipe that is deformed a little bit and is picking up uh, passive soil support as opposed to active soil pressures and that is really really critical in terms of 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 things that we can do and things that we focus on in terms of rehabilitation technologies and it has huge benefit in terms of these pipes still have a lot to give us they may look awful and 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 they have you know problems with them. But there's huge benefit in terms of the type of rehabilitation that can be done. If you ignore them, obviously it's very humbling. Uh, I, I go back to my personal experience and I live in the land of clay and concrete roads. So we commonly saw sinkholes in the 1980s and 1990s. And the, the pictures that, that, that uh, Brett showed originally are not new, they're newsworthy. But every one of these is a personal experience growing up in terms of, of understanding what happens if we don't do condition assessment, if we don't do anything about it. And, and they're, they're a valuable lesson. The, the concept of, of stabilizing it, though, is, a, is an intriguing one. And this is, a, this is the, the water supply into my hometown. It was built from 1913 to 1919. It was designed by the same people who designed the, the Catskill Aqueduct into New York. It's just a, obviously a smaller version of it. One of the things about you know structures that evolved out of that time is it it was about 20 years before Terzaghi and Peck ever wrote a geotechnical uh, textbook, so we didn't understand a lot. You know the engineers didn't understand a lot about compressible clays, and this is an arch section, and what we saw in this structure, and they saw immediately after it was built, before they even started to put water in it, is that is it just this little bit of compressible? The weight of the of the structure on it in essence would crack the invert of the pipe. And that cracking of the invert of the pipe, if you just imagine it, pushes out the sides. And if there's any type of force on the side, if this beam is there, it'll crack there and it'll crack at the crown. We also live in the land of compressible clays and highly uh, of clays that they may compress when they're soft, but when we get them wet, they expand and they swell. And, and the, the one thing that they could do when they constructed this is they took horses and they compacted the lower backfill very, very, and when you compact clay like that, it has swelling pressure. So we basically built a structure, 83 miles of it, a large portion through, you know, through clays and those type of soils. And in essence, all of it had cracks. Over time in the 1990s, when we looked at it, because it had clay around it, this process is very small, slow, but in essence, we went out and we searched, we found portions of this pipe, isolated portions of it, that had material degradation and we fixed those because we couldn't put you know strength back in all of the structure but the one thing we could do to these areas where the concrete was pristine is we could stop that process and we went in this is obviously man entry and and, and it's a big pipe and we went in and, and stabilized that structure by going into all of those cracks those fractures and injecting them and basically stabilizing the structure we did that in the 1990s and we've looked at it for about the last 20 years and that structure is pristine and obviously stabilizing the structure is something you know whether it's done through this type of form or the lining technologies or stopping that thing is very very cost effective in terms of making good investment of that hole in the ground how does this relate to pipes well if you you, you go and look and, and scale this up in terms of the big picture and, and look at things there's about six phases we can fix a pipe you know, we look at a, a traditional program, we can stabilize the pipe, we can 
We could do renovation or lining techniques. We might have trenchless lining techniques where you just fix a little bit. On the other extreme, we might have digging a hole to do external point repairs, and we might even dig a few holes and then line it, and that's an augmented renovation, or there's some sections that we have to replace. One of the things that we can hang our hat on is that if we don't do any of these things, ultimately what will happen is the only thing left to us is to replace the whole pipe. And, and that's a huge benefit in terms of the cost effectiveness, obviously, and, and understanding when to do this is, is a value, which we'll talk about in the last section. But the, 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 the financial advantage of that is huge in, in a large program. This is a case study, again, from uh, uh, really was driven by the fact that to, to understand how to do trenchless work or, or where to apply different techniques, you need cost, you need condition assessment. And uh, in the first thousand miles of, of pipe, we looked at a little over a thousand miles, we'd spent $15 million. And uh, I, I remember having to explain why, why we would spend any more money on condition assessment. And, and I was tasked with, with putting together a business case for what was condition assessment, because we had, we at that time, we had a, about a, another 25 million projected to spend. So I had to build a business case for what we were doing. And all I did is I sat back and looked at, you know, like, what did we, what were we doing? What did we find? You know, first of all, one of the things we found is that 75% of the pipe was still pristine. These are really old pipes, low areas and, and, and areas. We found out that only about 25% of it really required work. And that's, that was in itself a lot of money. And I didn't even include that in my model in terms of, 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 of benefit. But the difference of things that only had a little piece of pipe. The difference of areas where we could stabilize the pipe, the difference in areas where you could do point repairs as a pull to full segment liners, and the difference in cost of lining versus replacement. The net impact of that condition assessment program, that $15 million saved us half a billion dollars. I never got questioned again on doing question, you know, on, 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 on uh, why do we do condition assessment? And that's and that was a very, very important thing of this, you know, this there's immense value in understanding how to go in and utilize that hole in the ground and that hole in the ground is the fact that a lot of rigid pipes that we work with they're not gone as long as we can line them as long as we can stabilize them as long as we can apply the right technique at the right time there's a huge investment in there that that is to be made and and from a practical perspective we just have to know where and when and with that we're going to do one more poll and then we'll close with a little bit of a higher level view of of how we pick this and how we answer those questions, where and when. Great, thank you, Chris. I'm gonna launch this last poll question. It should be on your screen momentarily. And that question, which pipe material type are most found in your rehabilitation program? Clay, PVC, concrete, brick, some or all of the above? you a few more seconds. All right, I'm going to close it out and share results with you. So there are the results. 28% clay, 22% concrete, and 40% some or all of the above. Great. All right, back to you, Chris. Thank you. So infiltration inflow, obviously we don't have to convince you that infiltration is a big, inf you know, a, a big factor in this. Uh, from a practical perspective, one of the things that I try to do as an engineer is I get these two things out of my vocabulary as one. I don't like to call them and I. Infiltration is detective work. Infiltration is looking for things that ought not to be connected to a sanitary sewer or dealing with things that are connected to a storm sewer. Infiltration is something that we can do about, and and the question is, is is that really hard to define? Is it hard to, you know, what do we have to do to to be a you know a good sleuth at, at understanding how to fight infiltration, where to look for it, you know, look for these areas. The the step back of things is is looking at things from a from a geological perspective, and and that sounds intimidating, but I am a pure pipe guy, and and it, it's actually not as complicated as it seems. 
One of the things that I, I used to do is go run around, and because I'm a Canadian, is run around from university to university to get soils maps and understand the geology of areas. One of the things I learned in the U.S. as I go to work is that you have this amazing database that we'll talk about in a second of a central repository for understanding soil structure in a in in all 50 states and and uh, and and all your territories, which is, is quite a remarkable uh, uh, data set. The the core of this is that you don't really have to be Carl Terzaghi or Ralph Peck. You don't have to be that level of it. And I, with all apologies to my, my learned friend, who's truly a, a sleuth at, at, at soil structure, from a practical perspective, if we sit back, this doesn't have to be much more complicated than understanding and characterizing soils as to whether they have cohesion or they are cohesionless. And when we take things that, you know, the soils that are you know, require a lot of compactive effort. It's kind of the inverse thing. Fine grain soils, things that are we call clays and silts, are things that exhibit cohesion, and they perform in one manner. And if we take the, you know, the sands and gravels, if we take the clay out of all these soils and we start looking at sands and gravels, those are soils that are good bedding materials, but have the unfortunate characteristic if we have defects is they wash out much easier, and they wash out over much shorter time frames. So again, with kind of stepping back and looking at the, you know, the CLAP studies that we talked about from the, from the Water Research Council is one of the things that they did is they defined these from a very, very simplistic perspective. Is it go in and mine these areas and call them good soils or bad soils from a progressive loss of ground perspective? Now, the, as I said, it's, it's inversely proportional to what they work as a bedding material, uh, but they, they have a, it's a very, very simplistic way, but a very powerful way to look at things. And one of the reasons it's powerful on a you know on a on a city by city basis, as I said, south of the 49th, north of the 49th parallel, I can go into every university and I can find it every city because that's where the geotechnical engineers hang out. In the US, I can go and to the, to the Department of Agriculture. And I, I'm always in awe that the, the the soil survey that was created in terms of the web so, soil survey was not created for an engineering purpose, it was created for agricultural purposes, obviously. But the data that is in there is of immense value to be mined in, in different manners for geotechnical properties. And, and there's, you know, you can you can look at it for materials. These are these are just a, a not intended to be something you can read at a high level, but from unified soil classifications to hydraulic conductivity, we can look at them for corrosion, we can look at their you know different types of aspects. But at the core of them, and, and for the problem of infiltration, one of the things it allows us to do is to break them into these simplistic units, and we can do that with depth. So we can create ourselves, use GIS, and, and create ourselves an understanding of where these are spatially, and in very, very simplistic terms of good soils and bad soils. This is uh, happens to be in, in, in Salt Lake City. This is There's always little missing areas, so some days you have to go to the university and fill in the blanks. Uh, this is DeKalb County in Georgia, same type of thing. One of the things that you'll see starking of these of the areas that we're concerned about that we would call bad soils that, that have, you know, progressive, you know, like a, a much higher risk of progressive loss of soil are isolated pockets and more commonly isolated pockets. And that's very, that is not uncommon. The other thing that is of real value in these databases is that they're spatially accurate. They're in UTM coordinates. And that's very powerful because now I can take my my just my map, my Google map, I can take my, my GIS system and I can overlay it with soil structure and I can create a model around the pipe. And believe me, that's that's a lot easier than drilling it all. That's a lot easier than trying to understand the bedding around every pipe. And that gives you a very, very good understanding, a very powerful understanding of vulnerability. And that's a that's a, a pretty simplistic way to go in and get your first order of, of understanding of where you need to be. So we can take that information and start to overlay what we know on the inside of the pipe. We can take our visual observations of, of inside the pipe and we can see these cracks and fractures. We can see these the evidence of the first loss of ground, that loss of stability. We can see the evidence of serious loss of stability, the stage three defect we talked about earlier. And if I throw into that fix that if this happens to be in a soil that has a very, very high degree of, of risk for soil loss, I better be, do something about that quick. And it helps you understand because in, in clay soils and clay strata, we, we can look at pipes in these type of condition states for many years, whereas in, in the wrong type of soil types, you'll, you'll basically have to react very, very quickly. And that gives you an understanding of how to, 
prioritize things of, of to, to put a timeline on how long these pipes may stay in that condition state or to give you some insight in where you should be looking and where you should be prioritizing your works. This is a, a just a, a blow up of that. As I said, in 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 uh, this is a, a a real pipe system in my whole town, and and we have you know characterized this in, in very very hypothetical terms by by looking at the regional geology, and we can look at the good soil and the bad soil, and we can look at the defect frequency in those soils, and we can look at the significance of defects in them. And in in this in the good soils, we basically don't see a lot of infiltration typically. These are in clays. There's not good soils to make the bedding, but as long as the pipe is sitting in those soils over time for a long period of time, they're sitting in soils where the degree of washout occurs over a much longer time period. And we'll see things at different things, but when we get into these type of soils, what we see when we go look at the pipe is fur, pressures. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that if you have holes in the pipe and you've got a direct pattern, we've got water flowing under pressure into the pipe in terms of gushers, that soil loss is going to occur over much time periods. And that's a very, very powerful exercise that you can do to get prioritization, to get clarity in terms of, you know, what to do when and uh, sort of what frequency to, to, to look at things and, and, and to, 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 you know, to get a better understanding of the significance of DTEX in terms of another layer of information to exercise good judgment. Material degradation is certainly can play a role, but even material degradation, you know, the, the, the loss of ground or it's the holes in the pipe that creates loss of ground that, that is significant. So many of the soil failures, even the ones there, the, the core thing that we're looking at is this, this loss of ground phenomena over time. The other thing that's important to understand is that rigid pipes breaking are not a bad thing. Rigid pipes breaking can play an invaluable role in buying yourself the next design life in the system. You just need some judgment as to, you know, how to get in at the right time and with the right technique in terms of what's the best way or most cost-effective way to mitigate that loss of ground. And it's a very, very cost-effective way at buying the next design life. It's huge. It, it, in my first time we went and did a business case for it, we generated enough savings or enough opportunity of savings to pay for a water treatment plant for a city of 600 or 800,000 people. And, and, uh, and in some places that would buy a water, your wastewater treatment plant. It's, it, the, the savings are immense in terms of there. And the key to that is that you got to know the soils around the pipe, make an effort to understand what's around the pipe, a, a little bit of, of geology, and hydrogeology in terms of, of the ability for water to flow and the, and the propensity for, you know, to have increased loss of ground. And, and that will give you immense understanding of knowing where to look and when to intervene in the context of building good, intelligent plants. The other thing I would suggest, and I just, it's a, it's a lesson, is that there's a lot more information out there. There's a lot of information that was corrected from a geotechnical perspective that was never Corrected, you know, collected for your intended purpose. But believe me, it is of immense value to us. And and these large, you know, understandings of geology and hydrogeology in regions that we do for many other reasons is is of immense value from the condition assessment perspective. And as I said, and I and hopefully you get the, an understanding that this may sound complicated, but it's not. In the context of of the way we can look at things relative to how Mark looked at this, the the level of detail that we look at things. May, you know, you can take it to the nth degree, but from a high level perspective, this is not that complicated. And you can, you can use some very, very basic understanding of techniques to make some very intelligent decisions and, and become informed and, and, and build business cases and, and be a star in terms of investing the right amount at the right time in the right location. And with that, we're done. Thanks, Chris. Um, so we are not going to have time for Q&A, but I would like to have Britt and Mark um, come back on, show your um, faces. Just if you have any closing comments, um, we've got about a minute. We need to keep this to, you know, two to three o'clock. So um, if there's anything you'd like to say before closing out, um, please do. Yeah, just thank you everybody for your time and for joining us. Um, I think it was valuable. Uh, we really enjoyed you know, speaking to you and uh, looking forward to the next opportunity again. Awesome. Well, Chris, go ahead. I'll wrap us out. If you have something to say as well, Chris, I'll, I'll finish this yeah, out. Just, but. Just, you know, questions that do come in through Q&A, by all means, uh, we'll follow up. We 
shortage of her time by talking for a full hour by all <laughs> and we'll address q and a in in written form and and share that information so yeah that's right that's right we definitely will um what a great presentation i chris and mark i really enjoyed getting to see how you guys look at all the pipe structure analyze find out on the element analysis and how the soil and the backfill and the haunching all that plays such a key role in the, stru the structural integrity of the pipe and its longevity right and how we have techniques that can come in and now uh, offset that uh, and enhance that longevity as well for pipes that are intact where we've lost or have the threat of loss of soils and pines and backing and backfill and um, I just say thank you to everybody that attended. Uh, special thanks to Chris and Mark for participating in this webinar with us. Um, we're always looking to advance the industry. We're always looking to advance our knowledge base and share that knowledge, which is what makes this fun, because it's all about what we know and, and sharing what we know uh, in order to uh, make everybody better. So thank you, everyone. Jessica, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thanks, guys. Um, the only thing I have left to say is be expecting a follow-up email probably on Monday. It's going to have a link to this recording um, as well as contact information for our presenters and some miscellaneous other information. Um, but if you have any questions before then, you can always email uh, marketing at avantigrout.com. That comes to me and um, I can hopefully pass on any questions you have in the meantime. Um, other than that, thank you and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.